Sweet. Good to go? Yeah. Cool. Richard, man, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. So, so I guess to kind of kick things off, it'd kind of be cool to get an idea of, of Winter Warrior, how it started. Sure. Well, I've been an MMA coach for um, since mid-90s yeah. um, in London, where I was from. When I moved to Australia in 2003, I, I was coaching MMA and it was very frowned upon, even more so than it was now. The UK was always kind of five years behind the US mm. in terms of the sport and its growth, um, but also the way it's perceived in the, in the media. Australia seems to be five years behind the UK. Oh, wow. yeah. So um, I opened up um, what was the first white collar MMA gym in Australia called mm. Platinum Extreme. And the idea was to try and bring people that would never normally walk through the gym, try and train people and break those preconceptions of yeah. you know, thugs, shaved head, tattoos, fighting, etc. cetera. Um, which did really well, um, but I was only kind of changing the mentality of people in that immediate area. Mm. Um, I put an advert out and the idea was I'd train one person free of charge for six months and there had to be someone that would never normally do MMA, mm. didn't know about it, an accountant, a tax man, mm. whatever. Um, they had to agree at the beginning that they'd fight someone at the end. Jeez. And yeah. I'd document it and I'd, I'd do a blog and, and do some video on YouTube and show that Joe blogs on the street can get a lot out of MMA and anyone can do it. Mm. So that's how it started. Um, so I did a Facebook post on the Monday and then by the Friday we had, I think it was just over 400 people. Whoa contact me through email and Facebook. I invited 50 people down and I held the first tryout. I didn't even really realize what the tryout was gonna involve. I just thought I'm just gonna train these people, see how they go. I've got a crew of coaches around me. Um, and we took 22 people, I think, for the first series. Mm. Filmed it for YouTube. Um, and the series went amazing. It was, it was great. And, yeah. and the things that I got from the series are, are not what I expected. I thought it was literally just about proving um, what the sport could give to people in terms of strength and conditioning and health, but um, it's, it's proved to be a much more powerful platform for, for all sorts of things. Sure. Um, depression, anxiety, attempted suicide. Mm. There's all sorts of reasons that people come and do this because it's, it's such a, a, a life-changing journey that these people go on. And it's kind of evolved from there. It's a great idea, but yeah. I mean, it's six months is such a, it's a short period of time. It is. You know, when did, when did you first have that, oh, okay, this is going to work? It was a series, really. I right. mean, the, the first series, we called it the pilot, and it was, mm. it was literally a pilot. Let's, let's try and see. Um, I had no idea, one, if it would be picked up and people would be interested in watching something like that, mm. and two, whether it could be done. I mean, I figured I could train one person, you know, all my attention on one person for six months, but to train a group of 20 people, um, and also, the, as it grew, the, the, the series, the, the, some of the amazing things happen in the series is when you have, you start with one group of people mm. and then you split them and right. they become red team, blue team. Mm. And they know that we've got red mat, blue mat, and they train oh, wow. the second yeah. half of the series. Um, they train together first so they get to really know each other. And then we split them in half and they don't know what team they're gonna be in. And then they're literally training in opposite mats and they're looking through the cage that they're going to fight in and not knowing who they're going to be matched up with and then half through that halfway through that phase then we start matching people up and it is a literally a roller coaster of emotions for these people because we purposely don't tell them what's happening tomorrow or the next week or the next week or even in an hour's time we want them on edge yeah, right because we want them to become stronger as people because i always say to the guys if you can fight in here with someone that you train with for six months and look at them every day in front of 2,000 people, you can do anything. Sure. And literally, that's the mentality that people have when they finish swim tour. Yeah. But by the time they've done this, they've done this training and they've been matched up, the, the whole point, what I want for them is on fight night, is when they step in at Luna Park, is they're, they're enjoying it. It's, it's the icing on the cake. It's their reward. Sure. It's not a stressful thing. It's, it's an exciting thing. So you mentioned that you got about 400 people kind of hit you up off the bat. Mm. And around about that time, you know, the media is pretty still kind of frosty yeah. to MMA. I can't imagine it was much warmer back then. No. You know, was, what was that like for you to see the media kind of ragging on something in Australia, but then to see the people actually desperately wanted it? Was that a bit weird? Yeah, the, the weird part for me was most of the people that, that applied had no idea, had never watched an MMA fight, didn't really know who the UFC was. Mm. They just heard about this this challenge and Tough Mudder was really bigger then and, mm. and I think a lot of people thought, oh, it's just trained for six months, you know, it's just a good way of getting fit. They had no right, idea right. what they were signing up for. <laughs> and most people that applied for the series 
know someone that's been on it previously. Mm. So they've already kind of been qualified. They know what it's about now. But even still, half of them have never watched a fight before. Wow. They're just not fans of the sport. Yeah. But they want, they're looking for that next thing. You know, it's not the, the demographic you'd expect either. It's, we have the average age of the, the men is, in this series is 30. The average age of the women is 31. These are people that are established in their life. They've got careers. Most of them got families mm. and mortgages. But they want, there's something missing in their life. And, sure. and this is, you know, we're trying to fill that hole. Does it still kind of surprise you the kind of people that sign up for it and the kind of people you meet and the changes that they make for yeah, it? Yeah, look, it's always surprises me. I mean, the, we, we take people from early 20s, all the, the, the eldest guy we've got this series is 56. Oh, wow. Yeah. 56 yeah. years old and he's going to fight in a cage. And how's he doing? He's good. He's good. Awesome. Yeah, he's that really good. Makes me feel severely guilty for not doing <laughs> more me, I, mean, I think I'm 45 and I think I'm getting Ooh. old now. <laughs> I look at this guy, I'm thinking, holy shit. But that just goes to show that this sport has got so much to offer. Saying that, we, we've got guys that you, if you watched, if you were here this morning, you'd see guys, you'd look at them and go, well, that guy's pretty fit. It, we don't exclude people that are physically fit because anyone can be physically fit. Mm. It doesn't mean that they can fight in a cage right. and be composed. So you mentioned before that it's uh, Winter Warriors now, not just in Australia, it's worldwide. Mm. So did you know when you started this idea that it was a worldwide problem and not just no. an Australian one? I mean, I, I, I did it because this is, I love coaching sure, and sure. it's my sport. But um, I knew coming from England that the stigma isn't just associated with Australian press, it's, mm. it's global. But I didn't realize how quickly Winter Warrior would pick up. I mean, um, we still get, hundreds and hundreds of people applying for the Sydney series. Right. Um, we've got Melbourne series running now as well. Mm. We've got Tasmania, Byron Bay's going in January, I believe. Mm. Um, Perth and the Gold Coast, three gyms in the US that I'll be announcing soon as well. So this is world domination now. It's, well, it's, it's just, it's great for, because if we're sitting here talking about the, the growth of our sport, reality is we're talking about the growth of UFC. Mm. And people still perceive our sport that oh you train UFC you hear it a lot yeah. yeah yeah you do because people just know it they they see these amazing athletes and they're amazing athletes on TV and they don't believe that they could ever do that mm. so it, it's, it's like I always relate back to growing up in England because I'm not going to be a premiership player it doesn't mean I'm not going to kick a ball around the park right but you have that mentality with mixed martial arts mm. so with to worry is exposing what we offer as a sport, not just about professional fighting. Sure. So that's what we're trying to do. Well, you kind of touched on my next question there, but um, the battle's not over. There's still a really no. vocal minority. What's the next step? Unfortunately, no matter what we do, there'll always be haters. People shy away from what they see as, as violence, which we see as a sport, mm. as martial arts, as combat. Right. And I don't think there's certain people who are never going to change their minds. And it's not because the sport isn't safe, it's because there's contact involved. Mm. It's the same as rugby. It's just one of those things that it's, it's going to take time, it's going to take acceptance, and a lot of it's education. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Richard, man, there are all the questions that, that I had for you today, man. Thank you so much for putting You're up welcome. with me. Um, cool. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you very much. Welcome. Awesome. Sweet. Thanks for that, man. Hopefully that was on. Um, yeah, nice that was good.